I think it's about time that we did a little uh, crash course of the color page, taking a look at all of the little features, all the need to know stuff so that you can open up the color page and get working on it. If you've maybe been editing in Resolve and you're like, what is the color thing about? Maybe we should learn a little about, about the color. Well, this is the video for you. Here we are in the color page of DaVinci Resolve 18, and I have quite a few shots here for our little demo. Just as a note, to get something into the color page, it has to be in a timeline from the edit page. And so you can either build your edit here in Resolve, or you can import a timeline. But either way, you have to have things kind of laid out in the edit page. And then you just have the timeline open and go down here to color and switch to the color page, and that'll have everything open for you. So the interface. In the top center, we have the viewer. This is what we're actually going to see when we render the project. Down below that, we have the clips. The clips are just thumbnails of every single clip in the project. It's a great way to visually kind of look at what's going on, navigate to your different shots and everything like that. When you click on a shot, the playhead of the timeline goes to that shot. It shows up here in the viewer and also any color controls or anything down below are going to affect that shot that we have selected. Down below the clips, we have our mini timeline. This is sort of just a preview of what the timeline looks like as far as the different video tracks and kind of how long they are and everything like that. So it's kind of a representation of that that you don't really get just by looking at the clips. This is kind of nice in some circumstances, but for the most part, I don't really use this. In fact, it's a really good idea if you can to kind of have all of your clips on one line if you go into color, just because it makes things a lot more simple. So the more you can kind of just flatten everything down to one line, kind of like this, the better. I have these text labels on to kind of help us for later, but it's not really that helpful for me most of the time to have this little timeline. And so I'll go up here to the upper right corner where we have all of our little buttons here and I'll click on timeline and that will close that panel. So down below our clips and where our timeline was, we have our color palettes. Now this is where most of your work in the color page is going to be done. And again, anything that we mess with down here is going to affect whatever clip that we have selected and, and we'll be able to see what it's doing here in the viewer. So if I grab one of these color wheels and I push a certain color into it, that's going to affect just that clip and we'll see it here in the viewer. If I want to affect a different clip, I can click on a different clip here and affect that one. So in a lot of ways, it's really simple, even though this is kind of a big intimidating interface, it really is just pick a clip that you want to adjust. It'll pop up here in the viewer so you can see it. And then you grab whatever control you want to grab and move that around to adjust the image. More on what these controls do here in a second. Let's keep on with our interface tour. This lower part is kind of split into three sections. We have the left palettes, the middle palettes, and the right palettes. Now, depending on your resolution and your screen and your display scaling and all these kind of fancy things, it's possible that you might only have two sections here or even one section if it's a lower res screen. It's not a big deal. You still have all of the tools that I have. They're just kind of hidden in these little tabs here. You see, when you click on one of these tabs, it switches out the palette and you can do different crazy things. Not only that, but each of these little tabs has little baby tabs. And if you click on the baby tab, that changes some kind of sub options for each of these palettes. So this is the curves palette, but you can kind of switch this to a hue versus hue curve, custom curve, whatever you want. Same thing for the color wheels. We're in our color wheels palette, but here we have color bars, log wheels, which are kind of different versions of the same type of control. Now, if this already feels overwhelming, don't worry about it. We're gonna walk through the ones that you need to know, and you can kind of learn the other ones as you're interested. One thing to note is on the very right of our screen, we have the keyframes palette and behind that, we have our scopes. If you don't know how to read color scopes, if you don't know what the heck those are about, click on this video right here because it's a very good explanation of how scopes work. You can even pause this video and come back. You know, it's okay, I'll wait. Okay, cool. I assume you probably did that in your back. And if you didn't, and you're just like eating a sandwich and you're like, wait, was that was I supposed to do that? Well, that just made it awkward for both of us, didn't it? Anywho, in the upper left-hand corner, we have our gallery. This is where we can save kind of presets, which we'll get into in a little bit. We also have our LUT browser. So we can grab something like one of our LUTs and we can double click to load that onto our image. And depending on what kind of image we have, it might look good or bad. 
but this is where you can look through all of the LUTs that you have on your system. To the right of the LUTs is the media pool, and this is where all of the media lives for our project. Usually in the color page, what we use the media pool for is just opening different timelines, which you can also do with this kind of little drop down right here. If you have multiple timelines, they'll appear on this little menu, but it's there if you need it. On the right hand side here, we have the nodes, which we'll get into here in a few minutes. This is something that is a little bit intimidating for some people, but it's really not that big a deal once you kind of wrap your head around it. We have a section to apply effects, which we'll get into in a second. And we also have our light box. If we click on this, this will open up all of our clips here in kind of a full screen view, and we can look at them all at once, which is a really nice way to kind of make sure the project looks cohesive and kind of pick out any kind of problem shots, as well as just navigate visually to later in your timeline, especially if you have something like a couple thousand shots, that's a nice way to kind of look at your scenes a little bit more visually. So that's pretty much the main interface. Now that we have a pretty good idea of the color page interface, we're gonna get into what some of these specific tools do. But before we jump into that, it's pretty important that we cover color management. What the heck is color management, do you ask? Long story short, color management takes this kind of gray desaturated looking image, which is typical of something that's recorded in a log signal, and it normalizes it and makes it look good on a monitor. So it takes your image from looking like this to something like this. And typically, if you're shooting with a camera that shoots in log that's kind of designed to be color corrected, you want to put on some color management before you really start messing with all these colors. Because any adjustments that I make under this color management are going to look different with that on than it would just messing with the untouched image. There are a couple different ways to color manage. One is in the nodes, which we might cover in a little while. The other is at the project level. So if you go down to the lower right hand corner here where it says project settings, we can click on that and go down to color management. And here where it says color space and transforms under color science, we can switch this from DaVinci YRGB to DaVinci YRGB color manage. There are a bunch of fancy options that, that we can adjust if we uncheck automatic color management. But for now, let's go ahead and just hit save. And what this will do is try to recognize the footage that we're working with and give us a good starting point for our color. So if I open up our clips here, all of these clips are looking a little better and that's because it's done its best to try and figure out what kind of footage this is. Because what it's really trying to do is kind of guess what camera you shot with, what the settings were, and it doesn't always get it right. If I right click on this and go to input color space, I can see what kind of footage Resolve thinks this is. It thinks it's Blackmagic Design 6K Film Gen 4, which is almost right. This is actually shot in Film Gen 5. So if I switch this to Gen 5, that'll give us a starting point that's a little bit closer to how it was shot. Now I can shift select any of these clips here in the color page, right click and go to input color space and set that to be the right color space. And depending on how it was shot, it might look nice or it might look oversaturated or have too much contrast, which you'll be able to adjust here with these tools. And if you have multiple cameras on the same timeline, you'll have to go through and tag each of these cameras. So this is from a red Raven, which is going to be a red color to red log film. This is shot on Canon C200. So that might be C log two pocket 4k pocket 4k film gen four. And that's pretty much what you're going to have to do to start out with unless you have raw footage. In the case of this last shot here, this is an R3D file. And so what Resolve will do is read all the information from the camera raw and it will apply the right color management to that clip. So that's a nice thing. But any shot that is recorded in ProRes or it's transcoded, or basically if it starts out kind of gray and washed out like this, you'll need to tag it with the right kind of color management. If you're not working with footage that looks kind of gray and washed out, then chances are you're probably not working with log footage and you can kind of just use these tools as is. But now that we have color management set up for all of our shots, we are ready to jump into these tools. So I'm gonna zoom in here to this shot and I'm gonna close our clips just to give us a little bit of room here. And let's start with, I think the most essential place to start when it comes to color grading in the color page, which is the primary color wheels. That's this lower left panel right here. It's the one that says primaries color wheels up here. There are some other kinds that look similar. Make sure yours says primaries, not log right here. And when we're talking about color grading, we're really looking to improve the image somehow. And we can adjust that in a few different ways. 
One of the main most obvious ways is kind of the brightness of the image, the exposure. That's something we can adjust here in the primary color wheels with this little slider under where it says offset. This is called the master wheel. If I grab this and drag it to the right, that's going to brighten up my image. Turn on my scope here. And if I drag it to the left, it's going to darken the image down. So I can adjust the brightness of an image just with that slider back and forth, and that's going to brighten or darken the image as a whole. Above that, we have this color wheel. This color wheel for the offset, if I grab the middle and kind of push it towards a direction, it's gonna push a whole bunch of color into my shot. So something like this is usually a little bit overkill, but if we take it maybe just slightly in a warmer direction, that can be a nice kind of warm feeling for our shot. So really we have two controls for the image as a whole under this offset. That's what color do we want to push into the image and how much do we want to push? I can reset with this little reset arrow here and how bright it needs to be by using this master wheel down below. Now, if those make sense, all of these are actually going to make sense here in a second because lift, gamma, and gain are the same kind of controls as our offset. They just affect different parts of the image. So the lift affects the darkest parts. So if I push some blue into the lift, it doesn't turn everything blue, but it turns the very darkest parts of my footage a little more blue. The gain is the brightest parts of the image. So if I push that blue, I'm affecting the brighter parts in the sky and kind of the highlights here a lot more than I am, say, this building. And for everything in between, we have the gamma. So if I push that, we're not really affecting the very darkest or very brightest parts of the image. The darkest parts are starting to turn blue, but they're not super, super blue. And same thing for the brightest parts. Those aren't bright blue right now. They're more of a white. So we can really kind of pick and choose what parts of the image we want to adjust by picking lift, gamma, or gain. And again, this is both the color and saturation and the brightness. So I can make the brighter parts brighter by boosting up the gain. I can make the darker parts darker by pushing down the lift and we get different results. The other kind of control in the primary color wheels are these little sliders here. A lot of them are self-explanatory like saturation. If I grab this and drag it to the right, that puts more saturation into my colors. I ended up having brighter colors. If I push the temp to the right, that warms up the image. If I take it to the left, it cools it down. And tint is pink and green. Contrast pushes more contrast into the image. So that's a bigger difference between the brightest and darkest parts. And pivot adjusts kind of what it thinks the difference is between the brightest and darkest parts. So if I push the pivot up, it's going to think more things are dark. If I pull the pivot to the left, it's going to think more things are bright and it's gonna kind of brighten more of the image. So open up the color wheels and start messing around with that kind of stuff. Let's take a look at some of our footage. Here we have a shot of the kids out in the forest. After our color management here, everything is pretty darn bright. So if we need to adjust the saturation, the brightness of the colors, we can just grab this saturation slider and push it to the left and push this back to something that's kind of reasonable. If we feel like we need a little more brightness in the midtones, we can grab the master wheel under the gamma and kind of push that up. That's gonna brighten the midtones. If we want the darker parts to be darker, we can take the lift and push that down, and that's gonna darken the darkest parts. Same thing for gain, you can move that around, and if I push it way up, the brightest parts, this kind of really bright part from the flashlight would be way too bright, or I can take it and pull it to the left so that we have something that's kind of reasonable. And I can bypass any color that I'm doing with this little rainbow button right here. And so this is where we were, and this is where we are now with those few adjustments. And remember, this is all happening under our color management. And so anything that we do here is getting kind of put through a filter that applies it to the image in a certain way. But it should still act pretty much how you would think. As you push the saturation up, things get more saturated. As you take it down, they get less saturated. Now let's talk about the curves. The curves are super important for kind of dialing in specific adjustments. And really, they're very similar to the lift, gamma, and gain. In fact, this lower dot right here, if you push it up, it's just like pushing up the lift. It makes the darker parts brighter. If I take this upper dot and push it down, that's like taking down the gain. It's making the brighter parts darker. If I grab a point in between and move it up and down, this is a lot like moving the gamma. But the difference is that I can draw a shape here and that's going to really adjust what my image looks like. This is really just kind of a graph between the inputs and the outputs of our color values. So if I grab something that should be about middle brightness and I push it up, all the middle brightness stuff is going to be brighter. If I do the same thing and take it down, all the middle brightness stuff is going to be darker. So what I can do is make a kind of custom contrast here by taking the brightish parts of the image and pushing it up and taking the darkish parts of the image and pushing it down. 
So I make this little S curve right here, and that brings a lot more contrast into our image, but I have a lot of control over exactly where I want those bright things to live. I don't want it up that high. I just want it nice and tasteful, and I can kind of dial in each tone of the image this way. I can also unlink the color channels here. If I switch here, the Y channel is the luminance, R is red, so if I take a little bit more red out of the shadows, we'll end up having kind of these cyan looking shadows here. So here's now, here's where we were. So it adds a little bit of cyan to those shadows. So you can get really detailed, you can get really crazy with these curves, and you can dial in your image amazingly just with those. In fact, if you only know the primary color wheels and the curves, you can do so much in the color page. That said, let's dive a little deeper. Here behind our primary color wheels, this third little icon over where it says log, these are very similar controls to what we had, but you'll notice that they're called shadow midtone highlights. This is really confusing because that's essentially what the lift gamma and gain are as well. But here's the difference. When I push like, let's say a bunch of pink into the lift, we can see that the darkest parts are adjusted really strongly, but everything kind of gets this pink wash, right? That's because we're kind of just taking some color here on the lower part of the scale and we're moving it around. And you'll see that as I do that, it affects the rest of the image along this line. It's just a little bit stronger in the shadows. Same thing for gain. If I move it around, it affects the whole image, but it's just stronger in the highlights. If we switch over to the log wheels, it doesn't really act like that. There is a point where it kind of cuts off the amount of the image that it affects. So it's sort of like if you were to put a point here and then you were to adjust things, you can get really crazy and it doesn't really affect the rest of the image, just the darkest parts. This part right here would be the range. And so if I wanted to affect a lot more of the image, I might bring the range up to the kind of the midtones. And as I move things around, that affects kind of the lower part of the image, right? So let's take a look at that in action. If I push the shadow really, really pink, we'll see it doesn't affect the image like moving the lift does. That's because there's a limit to how much it adjusts. And it's really only keeping everything in the darkest parts of the image. So now we have these kind of pink shadows, but the rest of the image looks fine. That's because of this little slider right here, this low range. And as I move this left and right, we'll see I can have it affect more and more of the image. And I can really kind of dial in exactly where I want that shadow adjustment to affect. And same thing for highlights. So if I make the highlights really pink, I can adjust this range, basically what we call the highlights. So this gives you a lot more control over how you adjust your image. The only problem is that you can really kind of mess yourself up because instead of three basic controls, there's five basic controls because you have these two ranges here. So it really depends on what we're going for here. If I wanna do something like adjust the image as a whole, to where everything kind of looks natural, I might do that in lift gamma and gain. So if I wanna make the whole thing just a little bit warmer, I might push the gain just a touch warmer and maybe do something kind of like that, right? However, if I wanted to just like give this a lot cooler shadows, I could go into the log and push this shadow and I can push it really far, I mean crazy, and it will only affect the shadows. And then I can kind of just adjust that range of where I want those shadows to live maybe something like that. And now we have kind of this stylized look. So it's not that one is right or wrong necessarily, it just depends on the type of effect you're going for. If this is all confusing, just go ahead and stay in the color wheels because you can do a whole lot with the color wheels, especially if you combine them with the curves. But that is something that trips people up a little bit is the difference between the log wheels and the regular color wheels. And since we're kind of on that subject, if you go up here to these icons and you switch to HDR, you're gonna have much more complicated color wheels. And really what this is, is a even fancier version of the log wheels. If you click on this little sunshine here, that's gonna show you in the viewer what the range is that each of these things affects, but it's basically the same thing. So dark is just the very darkest parts. Shadows are a little bit lighter. Light is a little bit lighter. Highlights and speculars. It breaks the image up into six or more zones so that you can really dial in some fancy stuff. Again, if you're just getting into color, I wouldn't worry about it too much right now. 
Behind our custom curves here, we have several different little versions of kind of a different curve. These we call the HSL curves because they adjust hue, saturation, and luminance of certain parts of the image. This hue versus hue curve will take a certain hue and it will remap it to a different hue. So if I add a point on this curve, that's going to select whatever hue this is. So if I grab like, let's say the blues, and I can add a couple points here to sort of limit this, and I can push kind of the bluish cyans up and down, and that changes those colors only in this shot. And so that's a nice way to take a specific color and kind of just tweak it a little bit. One thing to mention is that these curves, they kind of wrap around. And so if I go too far to the right and I keep pushing it, it actually pushes it out from the left again. So it kind of goes around the world, right? So that can be a little bit confusing when you have, say like a red or an orange, you might have your main color in the middle of this little curve. And then you have kind of the outside control points, but one of them is off screen like this and it ends up being over here. Just so you know, that's kind of how that works. It kind of wraps around the edges. I can select a preset right here. So if I just want to select the reds, I can click reds and that adds a big wide curve there. So it's easy for me to just select what is actually red. I can also in this mode, just click on the screen and kind of sample some colors. So let's say I want to sample this back wall. I can just kind of click and drag around and that will select the hue of the back wall. Of course, when you do that, it's going to select anything that's also that same hue, that same color. And so we're also adjusting the cap here and his shirt and some of the light that's hitting him and this logo right here. So this doesn't work in all situations. It's not perfect, but it's a great way to tweak an overall hue in the image. And similarly, we have hue versus saturation. So I can grab a specific hue, like maybe this yellow on this Game Boy, and I can desaturate just that hue. And anything that is that kind of yellowish is going to be desaturated. So that's a great way to selectively saturate or desaturate things. I can make the yellows a lot brighter and it really kind of changes the quality of the image here. Hue versus luminance, same kind of thing. If I grab this yellow on this Game Boy, I can make it darker or lighter. The problem with hue versus luminance is that it breaks pretty easily. We can see kind of that noise. And so we really have to widen this out if we're going to do that. We can adjust a little bit and depending on the quality of your footage and how much tweaking you're going to do, that may or may not be a great tool for you. Next, we have luminance versus saturation. So that's just picking something based on how bright it is. So for instance, this bright light right here, if I click that, that's going to be like just about the brightest thing in the image. And I can right click a point to get rid of it. And let's say I want to desaturate things as they get brighter like this. This is a pretty common thing in color. Let's say once this approaches white, it's going to be completely desaturated. So now we have this light a little bit more pure. So here's before and here's after. So instead of glowing this kind of cyan, it's just glowing white. Depending on the kind of style you're going for, that might be a great thing to do. We also do stuff like that in the blacks. Sometimes we take kind of the darker things down and you can do a curve like this after some like major color tweaking. And because the brightest parts and the darkest parts are still neutral, it doesn't look super weird. Like you can go really far in this kind of warm direction. And yeah, it might not look totally natural, but it doesn't look as weird as it would without this curve. So here's without it and here's with the curve. We kind of have those neutral shadows, those neutral highlights that kind of tame this down a little bit. Great tool. We also have saturation versus saturation and saturation versus luminance. So you can play with those. Those are really important. I use those all the time. Now, a couple tools that do kind of similar things. Next one would be this color warper. Color warper is really cool. It's sort of like all of those curves mixed together in a color wheel scope kind of thing. And by default, we have hue and saturation. So just like you would take one of these color wheels and kind of push it pink to make everything pink, this is kind of a map of where all the colors are in the image. And we can remap them by grabbing this little spider web thing and moving it around. So for instance, I could take anything that's red like this, and I could desaturate anything that's red. And so now all of our reds are desaturated. Or I could take my reds and kind of move those a little bit more towards orange. And at the same time, I could get rid of kind of the greenish oranges. I could saturate the more blue stuff. I can take all the purples out and you can get some really interesting effects just by messing with this a little bit. You can certainly go too far and break things and make the image look worse, but this is a great tool to play around with. There are a lot more things in here that we really have time to go over, 
but open up the color warper and play around with it because it's really, really nice, especially for doing things like limiting your palette. So if I just want to have like, you know, teal and orange or whatever, I can kind of push the other colors in a little more. I can move everything a little bit more towards orange and I have this kind of teal and orange look. Really neat tool. The next tool would be the qualifier, which is this little eyedropper here. And this is a way to select parts of your image and do a wide variety of things based on just kind of selecting it. This idea works a lot like green screen does. So let's just go to this next shot here. And let's say I wanna grab this blue. I can click and drag on screen. And as I do that, that's going to set the settings on these little sliders. These are my selections for my key. If I go up to the upper left-hand corner and click on this little magic wand, I can go into highlight mode and that will just only show my key and everything else will be kind of this neutral gray. And in this mode, I can adjust my selection to figure out kind of what the cleanest, nicest selection would be. I can widen this out and soften it a little bit. And I can select things by a combination of hue, saturation, or luminance. Or I can turn off any of these and just use the hue or turn this off and just use the luminance. And it's really kind of a matter of playing with these until you get a selection that you want. Now, this is something that if you don't have to use it, I wouldn't recommend jumping in real hard with this. People tend to get pretty excited about being able to select certain parts of their image with this kind of tool, but it's really tricky to get a good selection. And depending on how much adjustment you do, so if I take this selection of this blue and change the hue a lot, it might turn out just fine. Like this happens to work pretty well. But if I mess with this too much, like I start to take the gamma down, we see it's starting to act really weird. Like it has all this kind of noise and it just looks really, really bad. And there are ways to kind of make that selection better. But honestly, this is a little bit of an older tool that frankly, I would only use if you have to. A situation where you'd need to use something like this honestly is getting a little bit less common for me. For instance, some people use this to actually pull like a key for green screen, right? So I don't have a green screen set up, but we can select this blue. And you can adjust this and hit this little button right here, which is invert. And we could take the alpha here and we could do something like right click here in our nodes and say add alpha output and connect this little blue connection to the blue output. And now in the edit page, we have this kind of keyed out. So some people use that for like green screen, which I don't know if I would necessarily recommend doing. If it works, it works, but you don't have like tons of control over your key like you would in something like Fusion. So, you know, if it works, sure, but that wouldn't be my first go-to, probably. What people do use this for quite a bit is uh, things like softening skin. And so you can do stuff like grab the hue of just a person's skin and soften just the skin tones with this mid-tone detail slider like this, and I can push this to the left and it kind of softens out the skin. And because we're just selecting the skin, that softens the skin without softening like the other details like her eyes and stuff like that. So that's a kind of a quick way to do that. There are other ways to select skin and soften it, but that's generally what I use this for is being able to soften just the skin tones by selecting them and then using this mid-tone detail or even a little bit of blur. This is probably a good time to jump into windows. Windows are the fourth icon over here in the middle. And they're a way for you to select a specific area on screen with a mask. So a window and a mask are basically the same thing. It's a shape that you draw on screen to select a specific part of the image. So if I wanted to, I could select just her face like this and kind of soften it out. And anything I do down here in the color palettes, like pushing things orange or whatever, is only going to happen inside of this window. And what's cool is I can combine these so I can grab just her skin tone like this with the qualifier, maybe something like that. And you can see there's all this other stuff that's kind of showing up in our selection. Well, I can limit that with a window like this and just isolate her face, which is pretty neat. So now any adjustments that I make to her skin is just going to happen to her skin and just on her face. So you can combine these tools in a really powerful way. And basic controls for the windows are you can grab the middle and move it around. You can grab the kind of box around it to scale it, and you can grab these little red dots to adjust the softness of the window. So here we have it really sharp. The more we pull these red dots out, the softer it gets. Generally, you want your windows to be really, really soft if you can get away with it, because it's harder to notice a soft window than a hard window. 
But remember, we're not working on a still, right? We're working on video footage. And as this shot moves around, guess what? That selection isn't quite on her face anymore. It's sort of to the side. She's moving kind of under it. So what do we do? Well, we could animate this window and kind of move it around and keyframe it. And honestly, in this situation, that would probably work just because there isn't a ton of really specific movement. We have a really soft window, that kind of thing. But what's even easier is to track it. Resolve has an insanely good tracker that will track the motion of whatever's under your window. All we have to do is go over to the tracker palette right here and click on this track forward and reverse button and look what it does. Oh my goodness, it just sticks to her face magically. Look at that, takes two seconds, works awesome. And now even with this really insane adjustment, it looks like her face is purple, man. Looks pretty, pretty realistic as far as a really fake looking adjustment looks. <laughs> so we've had a deep enough dive into these palettes to where we, we need to talk about nodes. You know, we just need, we need to talk about it, all right? Family meeting. I'm gonna reset this shot by right clicking here in this, in this blank space in our nodes panel and saying reset all grades and nodes. That will bring this back to our untouched footage that is color managed. So nodes, what are they? What the heck do they do? How do they work? Well, you'll notice with the nodes here, we have kind of three little parts. This green dot on the left, the green dot on the right, and this little thumbnail in the middle. The green dot on the left represents the untouched image. So anything that we attach this to is going to get this image right here without any color correction on it. This right green dot is going to be the finished image. So this is the image that actually gets sent back into the timeline and is rendered out. So you can think of this as the beginning and the end. And in between, we have our nodes. So this thumbnail is a node. And you can think of a node as just sort of a group of corrections. It's basically like one step, okay? By default, every clip has one node. So if I hit up and down on the keyboard and move to other clips, we'll see those all have a node by default. Any of the adjustments that we make down here in the color palettes, those adjustments actually live in this one node. And I can do any number of things, right? So I can boost my gain, bring down my lift, warm up my color temperature, turn my tint more pink, boost my contrast, take my pivot down, put in an S curve, mess with the color warper, all of these things all at once on one node. So it's just kind of a group of everything that we do down here living in this one kind of big step for our color correction. So if we can do everything in one node, why do we even have nodes? What's the point of that? There are some situations where you're gonna want to do kind of one group of corrections and then do another group of corrections and kind of organize them a little bit. For instance, we might want to take our lift down and our gain up here in this first node. And I can right click to label this node and we'll call this contrast. Now let's say maybe I like this, but now I want to see what it looks like if this whole clip is a little bit warmer. Well, I could do this in the same node, but it might be a better idea to keep organized by kind of breaking this down into steps. So we can take this contrast node, I'll right click on it and go down to add node, add serial. A serial node is the default kind of node and they're designed to be added in a series. So first we start with this contrast and then we do this second node right here. So maybe in this node we'll warm things up like this and let's right click node label warm. And now we have this split up into two parts and we can preview each part separately. If we click on the number here, this will turn the node on or off and we can preview what this looks like warm or what it looks like without that warm adjustment, just by clicking on that number. I can look at this warm adjustment with or without the contrast that we added. And that's a nice way to kind of test things out as well. And you can split things out as much or as little as you want to kind of keep yourself organized. It's really based on personal preference for the most part when it comes to this way of organizing nodes. There are some people who will do a separate node for every single little tweak that they do. And there are some people who will do 10 different tweaks in one node. Kind of depends on how organized you want to get and that kind of thing. The other major reason we'd use nodes is if we're trying to limit a certain adjustment, let's say we want to adjust the color of these headphones. Well, I can make a new serial node, right click on this and say add node, add serial. I can also hit Alt S on the keyboard and we'll label this headphones. And using any of the tools that I have available, 
I could change the color of these headphones. So maybe I'll grab my hue versus hue curves and I can move those up and down. Maybe I want those to be more of a pink, but here's what's happening. I'm selecting that red in this node and it's affecting his shirt. It's affecting his lips and a lot of things in this image. And so what I really want to do is limit this adjustment with a window. So I can go to my windows and maybe I'll just grab a circle window and put it over the headphones like this and track it. I can hit, just hit control T to track and it'll track forward. And now I have the adjustment just on those headphones without messing with the red in his shirt, the red in his lips or anything like that. This kind of thing has to happen in its own node because I can't limit this curve with a window while I'm doing a bunch of other stuff to the rest of the image. A window actually limits the effects of the entire node, not a specific palette or effect down here. So this kind of thing where I'm isolating like one part of the image, that sort of has to happen in its own node. So that would be a good reason to make a new node. And again, those things can happen in a series. And there are actually a few different kinds of nodes, but for the most part, you can use serial nodes and be just fine. So that's really the basics of nodes. You have a starting point and it flows through these nodes like a flowchart, and they go in order and you can break out new nodes based on kind of keeping yourself organized. Or if you want to affect just a part of the image, you kind of have to make a new node, especially if you want to limit it with a window like this. A couple more things in the color page. I'll go to our last shot here. This is an R3D file, which means that it's red code raw. And when you have a raw file, just like in something like Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, there are adjustments that you can make to the raw image before it's kind of brought into doing normal color grading. We get to those adjustments in the very left-hand side of our interface here where we have this little camera, and this opens up our camera raw palette. Here's where we can choose the quality, all of our settings and everything. That's kind of where everything lives right here. This is where I can easily adjust something like ISO, color temperature, and that kind of thing. And if you're used to working in camera raw, this might be something that feels a little bit more comfortable for you. And if I switch this to clip, I can even change the color science and the way that the color space is treated in all kinds of fancy things down here. I'd say probably the most useful is the color temperature and tint, white balance kind of stuff, because you can change things in a really high quality way, just like you would have set this adjustment differently when you were actually shooting. You can kind of set it after the fact here. And depending on your camera, there are different options here really nice way to work. And that for the most part covers the essential kind of need to know stuff for the color page. I do want to show you a couple other fancy things that are only available in the paid version of Resolve, the studio version, that are quite cool. First one is noise reduction. That's this sixth little tab over. And if you have footage that might be a little bit more noisy, you can pretty easily remove a lot of that noise just by pushing up this noise reduction. And it does a very good job one of the better noise reduction tools I've used, and it also renders really fast compared to plugins and things like that. So here's with the noise reduction on, and here's with it off. So this is a major reason why people will get Studio is because of the noise reduction. Whole lot of cool stuff here. You can also add motion blur, all kinds of cool stuff. Another Studio only feature is the magic mask, and this is pretty crazy. You can just draw on a subject that you want to select like this, and I'll click on this mask overlay here, and it will highlight what we have selected here in red so that you can isolate things. I'll switch this quality to better real quick. And it even like selects his little hairs and everything. It's really amazing. And I can just track this back and forth. And now we have a really high quality selection of just our actor, and we can adjust him separate from the rest of the footage. And I just gotta say, it's insane how good this is. I don't even know how they do this. Like, look at that. It's basically like rotoscoping him without any effort. It's wild. So again, if you're looking for an excuse to get the studio version of Resolve, that's, that's a good one. So there's an overview of the color page. I hope that is helpful for any of you. Hey, if you have any questions or thoughts, or why don't you put them down below and maybe I'll address them in a future video. <laughs> maybe, we'll see. Or maybe I've already made a video and we'll just, we'll just say, hey, this is already a video. Either way,
you get the knowledge, you get what you came for. Hey, if you're learning a lot and you want to learn more about how color works and kind of the more intricate details of the color grading process, we have an amazing course called Professional Color Grading in DaVinci Resolve. It's updated with lessons for Resolve 18 and we're gonna continue to update it for the foreseeable future. We go through all the major concepts of color grading a project inside of Resolve and you get to sit by my side while we color grade two projects together. It's a, it's a fantastic way to learn, so make sure to check that out right here or in the description.